live in New England and Salem is a huge tourist attraction up here. I used to go every year with my parents. My parents were Christian, but my mom dabbled in Wicca for fun. My dad would get upset about us seeing her books, but my mom raised us as Southern Baptist, never really defined herself by one religion. She always seemed to believe them all, even ancient religions. She was a big fan of Egyptian history. She was also a psychiatrist and found every religion had a form of healing mentally, which is why she studied many religions in the first place. Most of her documented work was about the fine line between healthy ways of health through religion and creating harmful disillusion. She worked with troubled teens. Every year, we would go see this one psychic as my mom really liked her. She liked her ability to read people on a psychological level more so than magical. We would explore the historical parts of Salem for my dad, whose interest has always been math and history. A few degrees in engineering and math, but one in history because he could. He would teach us the history during daylight hours, and at night my mom would take us around to the creepy, mysterious, and magical stuff. This divide often left us with only my mom at night, as my dad would sleep in the car to prepare for the hour's long drive home. At the point this starts, I was 15. I played online video games and just got into World of Warcraft. As a female, I got a lot of weird attention. Frame reference, I'm now 30. It was the last year we'd visit Salem as my mom was getting sick, though I didn't know it yet. I told my guild I was going to Salem and one guy chimed in that he'd lived near it and would love to meet me. I explained that I was going to be with my parents and be weird if some guy I'd never met showed up and thought nothing more of that. I played with my two older brothers and they were in the same guild. Neither of them said anything either. What I didn't know is this guy was actually a Facebook friend with my brother and I just joined Facebook as it was recently open to high school students too. I didn't know but he knew what we looked like. So the day arrived, we packed up for the day trip to Salem. We were excited as usual as both my parents always took extra care to make the trip exciting. And my brother brought his new girlfriend and other brother brought his best friend that I had a huge crush on. We didn't get to do much as a family as my brothers were in college and my parents worked a lot. None of us knew the day would be much scarier than jump scares and spooky stories. We did our usual routine there, showing off our costume, got tasty food from vendors and just having a good time. My mom at the time was taking our younger brother who was nine to do the kitty stuff so I wandered off with my brothers. For those who have never been to Salem, it's mostly the downtown and turned into a giant witchy fair basically but with historical buildings instead of barns. My parents gave us a hundred dollars each to go shopping and have fun. My oldest brother brought beer and let me try it but it was gross so I got some apple cider. My dad had gone to the car and my brother was commenting on all the hot girls with his friend and my other brother distracted with his new girlfriend. I had no friends in my high school so I just sat alone on a rock wall nearby as they chatted and played around. I decided to go off and get a snack and these fake tattoo art nearby. My brother's girlfriend said she'd join me soon and stay at the artist if I finished early, leave it to a girl to be maternal I guess. As I hit my apple fritter in line, someone tapped me on the shoulder. I immediately thought that it was my brother and his girlfriend and turned around to find a twenty-something year old nerdy obese guy with curly long greasy hair standing over about a foot taller than me. He was wearing a Warcraft 2 shirt and he greeted me and asked me if I played WoW. I assumed he was looking at my backpack which I drew all over and it had World of Warcraft written on it. I always carried my backpack with my laptop full of sketching supplies as I get bored easily. P.S. The laptop I had then was about $2,000 HP and incredibly heavy. He explained he played too and was excited to meet a girl who played WoW. Going to a small school myself, the only people I knew who played WoW were my brothers, their friends and their friends' younger brothers who weren't my friends. Despite not having friends, I was a friendly extrovert. I lost popularity due to a fallout with friends where I was made out to be a bad person, but that's a long story. So I greeted him kindly as I would anyone. Honestly, I just got the vibe that he was looking for a friend. Currently lost all my friends, and a small school of 200 people total for all high school, it's easy to have your whole grade of 54 people against you. 
It was a prep school, too, so cliques were absolutely toxic. I felt sympathy for him as it sucked not having friends, and I was absolutely more vulnerable as a result of losing all my friends and having an entire school hate me, essentially. So, we chatted. I didn't even pick up creepy vibes until he mentioned my brother's names. It seemed like a mistake as he tried to cover it up after. Only then I started feeling nervous and it showed. Stupid me just kept nodding to his questions but I had chills, too much to answer anymore verbally. As it was my turn to get a fake tattoo, the lady doing my tattoo obviously saw my discomfort and whispered if I was okay. I didn't want to say anything so I simply shrugged. Immediately this guy goes off, asking what she whispered to me. A huge red flag went off as he became possessive of me, saying stuff like I shouldn't talk about people behind their backs and it's rude. He said something along the lines of me being a tease and stormed off after bike cops started coming over to see why this guy was yelling. Now wouldn't that be a fine ending? I wish. The cops asked who he was and I told them I didn't know him. They asked me my age and name, etc., and the lady quickly finished up my tattoo and rejected my payment as I was swiftly taken away by police to a tent that they had set up. There I called my mom who rushed over like the end of the world had just happened. I got scolded of all things and my brothers were about to get their butts handed to them on a platter. She was told by the female officer that a man had been harassing me and it was lucky they showed up. FYI, cops are in plenty around Salem, especially in October. About 30 minutes had passed by the time I met up with my mom and the creepy guy stormed off. She frantically called my brothers but neither picked up. My mom was fuming so I ran over and bought her an apple cider, a family thing, and it seemed to cool her off for a bit while we looked for my brothers. So after another 30 plus minutes, she sees my brother and his girlfriend frantically looking for me around the tattoo booth I was originally at, and off my mom went, and I was left behind holding my baby brother's hand. At least the confused look on his face made me smile. My mom is overly protective of me as we lost my little sister 11 years before this due to choking. She was a baby and choked while no one was looking, so she would get extra mad on my account, going as far to get a teacher, rightfully fired for keeping me in class during an asthma attack from an idiot spraying perfume in my face. Another teacher overheard and pulled me out of class, but not without embarrassing me by screaming at her during school hours. So here my mom screaming at my brother and his girlfriend for being reckless. My mom's worst nightmare is kidnapping, probably as are most parents. It was quite the scene honestly, but I tried to focus on my baby brother and make him laugh instead. He was everything to me those days anyways. Now he's pretty rude and mean, but different events transpired to turn him from a sweet kid to a mean adult. I didn't think about where my other brother went till the drama unfolding I guess lured him and his friend to my mom, but as he was walking to my mom to seemingly break up the fight, he was always the calm one. I saw a creepy wow guy in tow with him and his friend. I simply did what every dumb sheltered girl does. I froze. My brother calmed my mom down and eventually told my mom the creepy man was his friend from video games and was just making sure I was safe since I was seemingly alone. During all this time I guess he found my brother and spun the story to being a white knight though at the time I was simply clueless to that level of manipulation. My mom turned around to thank him and said sorry for the misunderstanding. They all talked for what seemed like forever but eventually my baby brother pulled me out of my frozen state by needing to pee. I took him to the bathroom after telling my mom. Honestly I was just stunned and didn't think people would believe a 15 year old over a college student. But suddenly this creepy guy runs up to me and my baby brother is saying he can take him to the boys room so he doesn't have to go to the icky girls room. As an apology for catching me off guard, he was just worried about me. I don't know why but I yelled at him simply, no, he's going with me. I think that's where Cog starts moving for my mom, that this guy wasn't all there. My little brother insisted on going to the boys room now though but... Thankfully, my oldest brother stepped in to take him, but creepy wow guy followed in saying he had to go pee anyways, and that's all. I think my mom picked up on my discomfort after this and asked if I wanted to join my dad in the car. Honestly, I wanted to, but 
I also wanted to see a certain tent we passed by before and we still didn't see my mom's psychic yet. So we gathered back up as a family and creepy guy tagged along to see a few more things and wrap the day up with my mom's psychic. In one store I saw a cool dragon statue that was two dragons and a heart shape written on it, eternal love, but it was 200 plus dollars and didn't really go with my pink room with cat figurines and real cats everywhere. I simply thought it was cool. Creepy guy kept asking me small questions about my school every so often and World of Warcraft. But the one thing that stuck out to me that only my brother's friend overheard was if I liked anyone at school or had a boyfriend yet. My brother's friend actually was a senior at my high school, my brother a freshman in college. He chimed in saying, I don't know, but she's going to prom with me. We actually ended up going prom together long after this as friends under strange series of events, but at the time, we never talked nor had any plans to go to prom together. I think a light bulb turned on for him and saw that this guy was creeping on me. At this point, we knew his age and he was 27 in community college. No judgment for those going to community college or older in college, but that was a red flag as he bragged how he was wealthy, how he turned down Yale and was going to graduate top of his college and so on and my brother's friend was very uncomfortable with a 27-year-old asking a 15-year-old about her love life. My brother's friend was 17. But being dumb teens, we never made a point to tell my mom or my brothers. We both just bottled it up, I guess. I won't lie, though. I crushed harder on him after this. We got done with the psychic, and we headed back to the car to my dad after Mr. Wow creeped and tagged along. By the time we reached the car, my mom had tried to get him to say bye a few times, but he insisted that he park the same way as us. It should have been a red flag, but we were all tired of walking all day. At the car, he gave me that $200 statue. I never saw him buy it. I think he stole it, truthfully. My mom kind of just said it was nice of him and he didn't have to, but I could tell that she thought it was weird. Eventually we'd make it to the car and he insisted on meeting the daddy of such a wonderful family, is what he said. Now that gave us all a chill down our backs. My dad stands at 6 foot 9 inches and by no means someone that you should mess with. He did college football for two years till a certain injury took him out. He limps a lot more now that he's in his late 50s due to it. My mom and I are only about 5'2", so it's quite a difference considering only... My 18-year-old brother is the tallest brother standing 6 foot compared to my dad. We're all small to him. My dad is one of those guys who always dresses in a suit too. Typical businessman. Our family was well off due to both my parents being well-paid professionals. I don't know why my dad always wore suits though, even on holiday, but it definitely made him more intimidating to this nerd guy who before this projected confidence. My dad immediately picked up on my discomfort as this guy mentioned my name saying oh and with my name you raised such a beautiful daughter too after he was done saying how nice my dad's family was and bragging how his sons are great blah 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 now my dad's not just an engineer for fighter jets but a businessman and boss so he handles himself with decorum usually unless it's with his friends and they're joking around my father responded to him sternly probably making most people freeze because he has a really deep, authoritative voice. FYI, it sucks when you're his kid because this voice is truly scary when you're in trouble. That same voice he uses when we've done something wrong, he projected on this guy saying, If you would please back away, I would like to take our family home. Pointing at my mom. My dad was a conservative, but he gave full credit to anyone who worked hard regardless of their religion, color, or status and was apparently already peeved by him constantly saying it was my dad's family. When my mom puts just as much effort and money into it, but mentioning me and creepy vibe was my dad's last straw. He kept saying goodbye and he'd see us online, waving till we were out of sight. So yeah, still not the end. Sorry, in the car we all joked a little about how weird he was, but quickly cheered up with food and TV. If you've ever been to Salem or most any historical towns in New England, a bunch of one-way streets and mazes to get anywhere in the center of town. In this time, a car eventually got behind us that took every turn we did. Everyone but my dad was too tired to notice. We were eating treats and watching TV with a VCR and DVD my dad installed in the back. Honestly, it was pretty cool back then. 
While we watched scary cartoons recorded off of Cartoon Network about an hour away from home, I noticed my mom and dad whispering and mumbling stuff. Usually this was my parents' sort of intimate talk, incoherent but usually obvious on body language, so at first I just wrote it off. A few towns away from home, though, I noticed the body language, as did my brother's, wasn't that kind of talk at all, but stressed and worried. My mom mumbled something about police and told my dad to pull off the highway to the rest stop. The car went quiet and we pulled off. My mom got out and my younger old brother asked what was going on as we were probably 20 minutes from home. It wasn't long till we looked at what my dad was looking at intensely. Old, beat up, off-white, dirty car and in the driver's seat was the creepy World of Warcraft guy and a kind of older, druggy looking guy in the passenger seat. The WoW guy quickly leaned back to hide his face as we all turned to look at him, but it was definitely him. My brothers at this point were also confused and trying to figure out stuff as my dad was sitting there silently staring and angry. My brother's girlfriend was obviously nervous and my other brother's friend was obviously unsettled, but both were quiet. My oldest brother opened the car door and got out standing outside the core. My dad yelled at him to get back in and close the door. I should mention the car we had was a large SUV that was very white that stood out so probably not hard to follow in the dark either. Eventually, cops pull in and World of Warcraft guy pulls out with another vehicle following him as the police pull up to my dad's car. Now in an action movie, cops would probably have taken off and followed them but he just asked my dad questions which I found disappointing but I guess we had no proof or anything. My mom soon joined and my dad got out of the car as they talked and eventually it was all over. We got home and I went straight to bed. My older brother stayed up a bit talking but I was just worn out and my little brother was already asleep in the car in a candy coma so he was carried in like the rest of the day trip luggage. I usually stay up until about 1-2am to 2 on weekends gaming but I couldn't today. Plus, I had school projects to finish the next day, so I fell asleep at around 11 p.m. Around 2 a.m., my AOL Instant Messenger went off. I slept with my laptop on usually, not very environmental, but I used it for music to sleep. It immediately woke me up. Anyone old enough to know that AIM Messenger's sound knows it wakes you up. Now, my AIM screen name was the same as my character in World of Warcraft, so easy for people to add me. The request was from someone I didn't recognize. I groggily accepted and rolled over, but it wasn't long before a few messages popped up that I was half asleep to read. Then my bones went cold. That actually happens when you get scared enough and I felt my body get cold soon after. Long story short, my dad parks the SUV outside as my brother's cars, mom's, and dad's four cars take up the garage. This guy messaging me was the wow creep obviously at this point, but he was saying how nice it was to meet me and now that he knew where I lived, he could drive down any time and we could hang out. He continued on with paragraphs of how he thought I was cool and his sob story, constantly bouncing between how he liked that such a beautiful girl play video games to his life is a mess and how successful he is, like flipping through personalities. It was weird. After like five plus minutes my brain was awake enough to go get my brother. I first went to my oldest brother's room on the third floor but the sounds I heard in there were basically do not disturb. So I went to my other older brother's room and him and his friends were asleep so I felt guilty. I didn't want to wake up my parents and I debated just waiting till tomorrow to say something. But I looked outside and a chill ran down my back remembering that he somehow knew where we lived. It was enough to wake up my brother with tears in my eyes. His friend woke up too as I was telling my brother the guy was messaging me on AIM. They both take a moment and suddenly their expression changed from tired to frantic as they both walked fast to my room. As they read through the messages they got to where he said that he knew where we lived. My brother said that he must have followed us somehow or saw the car outside. Both of them tried to think of ways to handle it. I guess feeling the same way and not wanting to wake our parents or trying to be strong. Eventually they both concluded the cops needed to know but didn't want to call the emergency line so my brother eventually went and woke up my mom. 
My dad's a heavy sleeper, so at first he didn't come into my room. My mom read over the messages and took my laptop away. I actually took it away for two weeks after this, too, which sucked. She went into her bedroom and woke my dad as they talked, and my brother and his friends sat in my room trying to comfort me in their own ways. I honestly wasn't as scared as I should have been, mostly because I was way too focused on my crush at the time. We also had ten cats, so I had four cats in my bed, all full of threat reduction skills. My mom, I presume, called the non-emergency line and printed the messages. My brother and his friend eventually went back to his room and I fell asleep in a pile of purring cats in my bed, so it wasn't difficult. I woke up late, breakfast was done, but I heated up leftovers. My alarm clock was my laptop, so partly why. I guess my parents thought it was best not to wake me as they were gone when I woke up. In fact, as I realized, everyone was gone. My house was big, so it was usual to not see anyone for hours, so I didn't know how I was home alone till they all came back. They all went to give statements as my neighbors watched the house and my little brother to make sure that the creep didn't show up. From what I know, my mom didn't want to involve me so much as she was scared of the psychological effects of something of that sort. So many details I only learned from my brothers after my mom passed away. But I guess they searched for the guy, but they never found him or the guy in the car with him. According to my dad, it was two cars following us. The name he had on Facebook wasn't his real name either, so all they had was his one profile picture. That actually wasn't him at all. So, he wasn't caught and a patrol car would go down our street a couple of times that night. Now, it should be the end, but again, he continued to cause problems. He left the guild, a sort of group in World of Warcraft, shortly after and deleted his character a week later. But back then, you had no idea who a character was attached to. At least these days, a WoW account is a wide messenger, so you know your friends list characters and can block accounts. But back then, you could only block a character and someone could make a new one and you'd never know that they were the same person unless they said so. Months later, we got a new guild member and none of us ever thought to change our usernames or more. By this time, my brother's friend had joined us in World of Warcraft and we'd be kind of become friends after the drama at school had settled down. Long story short, my friend's cousin had asked me out and we wanted a date and he got really handsy. I mean, he didn't take no for an answer and the guy working the theater saw this and called the police. Then my mom got involved. My mom reported him to the school and he was expelled. And I was then the target of lies and hate as he was really liked at the school. I guess my brother's friend heard my side without the lies and decided to be my friend, kind of since I didn't have anyone. So he felt more sorry for me though. But we chatted on World of Warcraft and it was obvious I had a huge crush on him, especially as my brothers would point it out in the guild to embarrass me. But never did I think that I would be manipulated through a crush like this. In short, I was catfished into thinking my crush made a secret character to message me. One day this character messaged me pretending to be my crush and love struck me believed it. For weeks we messaged flirty messages and I was over the moon happy. The person told me he couldn't show it in person as he was scared my brother would stop being his friend. I believed it. I fell into it like an idiot. I thought my 15-year-old self had a secret relationship with my crush. I was very, very wrong. One night he asked to meet up with him in town after my parents went to sleep. I told him to pick me up, but he didn't want to come near my house and fear my brother would see his car. So he told me to pick a place in town and give him the address. So I did. I did, but luckily for me, I had started connecting with a girl above my grade. Not really friends, but not enemies. I offered to give her $50 to drive me to a place in town. He said that he'd be there at 1am and should give me enough time to walk there. I didn't even think to tell him that I was catching a ride. It was pretty freaking cold, so I didn't want to talk. He also said he had a Christmas gift for me and wanted to kiss me, so I was over the moon not thinking anything through. Three hours pass and my ride shows up. I give her the money and it seemed to make her friendly enough that the car ride wouldn't be too awkward. She asked why I needed to go out this late in the cold to the park. I told her I was meeting someone from school in secret and I'd give her more money next week if she didn't tell anyone who. 
I had full awareness that she was involved in a lie or two about me, so I was willing to buy her silence if it meant I didn't have to wait out in the cold. So after less than 10 minute ride, we get to the park and I wait for a text. I had a phone and I was showing it to her when the girl asked to see it because she thought it was cute. While we were talking about phones, I got a text that said, I'm here. We both looked around and don't see anyone in the park or parking lot. I texted back I didn't see him or his car. I knew where my brother's friend drove as he drove me home a few times. He messaged to go to the other side of the park, but again it was cold and I definitely didn't dress for the cold. I told him to come to her car because I wasn't dressed for the cold, with a little winky face. He said he didn't want anyone seeing us together, so I texted back that I already bought her silence. After this slow texting cat and mouse game, it felt weird, but I couldn't understand why I felt off. He messaged me, saying he had my gift and wanted to give it to me in private. So, I borrowed her jacket and went to the middle of the park where there's always a lit building with bathrooms and they were locked at this hour. But standing under the light, I lost my distance vision to see in the dark far away. I could see a figure on the other side and an outline of a car. He started walking towards me and my heart was racing with fear and excitement. I decided to walk towards him too, getting close enough not to see his face but the moonlight on his car. My brother's friend drove a black sports car, and this car was light gray or white, and not even the same shape, it was like boxy, unlike any sports car I've seen. I stopped walking to stare at it, parked on the side of the road trying to make out more details, when I saw a person in the car's driver's side. As he got closer, you could see his curly hair. My brother's friend did not have curly hair, nor was he pudgy. All I knew at this point, the guy waving at me wasn't my brother's friend. I turned point and ran back to the girl's car without even thinking. I had no idea what to think but my body just reacted. I got in her car as I slammed the door. I caught a glimpse of the guy under the light standing there. and It was the creepy World of Warcraft guy. He lost a good bit of weight but still wasn't fit but his hair and face were unique enough that I was pretty certain it was him. My mind was rushing as the girl asked me what was going on. I couldn't even process it. I was more heartbroken than scared. Typical teenager. I eventually got out what I needed to and told her I needed to go home now. She got out of there fast as I told her he followed us home a couple of months ago and left me creepy messages. And She was obviously scared and checking behind her. After getting home, she asked me what was going on. She thought it was my brother's friend. I told her I didn't understand myself, but I was scared. In my mind, about a million different reasons came up to make me believe that he hacked my brother's friend's character, and that was less painful. Anything that meant his friend liked me back, and it was anything but the obvious. Afterwards, I got inside and cried. I felt like my first breakup, and it was all I could think about. Not my safety, but the fact that I had thought all this time my crush liked me back, but it was a creep instead. I ended up falling asleep on the couch and the next morning my mom woke me up all worried. I told her everything, bursting out into tears as I felt her body go tense in embrace. My mom calmed me down then called the police. I was scared that they had arrest my brother's friend or tell him about the exchange of texts between who I thought was him and I begged her not to. The cops arrived in quite a quick time but took my phone and laptop. This time it was serious as it was considered attempted kidnapping. I just cried, mourning my relationship that I never really had with my crush. I told them everything. They asked multiple questions over and over too, so it was tiring. I ended up missing school that day and the girl who drove me, well, she had her own elaborate story that mostly painted me as a liar and I had an ugly older secret boyfriend or something, just more fuel to the friendless fire. Well, after months, they found nothing on the guy and eventually we all put it in the back of our minds. My dad installed a security system and we went about our lives. I continued to play World of Warcraft and other online games. I ended up going to prom with my brother's friend because his date canceled on him and he had a free ticket. We had fun, but far as I knew, cops never spoke with him. 
Eventually, I graduated and went off to college, met a new guy who played WoW and dated him through college, but we broke up after college as I didn't want kids. My mom died soon after, and it all kind of sucked for a while, causing a whole series of events making my baby brother's life trouble. I spent years trying to help him, have it blow up in my face, and overall not speaking with my family all that much. I started streaming on Twitch for World of Warcraft and a few other games to pay for extra stuff as I was entry level job straight out of college, where I started learning makeup and really blossomed, realizing I was actually a lot more attractive than I gave myself credit for, and got really into shape. This part of my life was full of let's not meet stories itself, but one follower eventually caught my eye as he kept saying something that just made me feel uncomfortable. For about six months a guy would join randomly and talk about how smart he was, got into Yale and turned them down, his troubled life at home and how much he loved Salem, Massachusetts at this time of year, fall. But after I met my now boyfriend, he stopped showing up. Part of me wanted to track the guy down, but I just wanted to move on with my life. I currently have a house with my boyfriend of five years, four cats and a dog. Our anniversary is Halloween as we met at a Halloween party so we kind of celebrate. My current boyfriend and I still play well, on and off along with other games and it was a big reason he was attracted to me at a party when I was dressed as Zelda. He is physically my dream guy so it was an instant match. My boyfriend wanted to go to Salem, Massachusetts last year as he's never been and loved my fun stories of my mom and dad there. He took me there as a surprise thinking it would be fun. I had some fun remembering the good times with my mom, but the lingering feeling of looking over my shoulder was there. My mom's psychic was still there too, so I had to. She didn't recognize me, unfortunately, but was perceptive enough to say, your fear of your past comes back and lingers heavily tonight. I probably looked anxious. All the memories came back yesterday when a guy in our guild asked if he could meet up with us in Boston for Halloween as... He lives there and would love to meet us. My blood ran cold as we didn't really know this guilty and my first thought was, what if it's him? What if it's creepy World of Warcraft guy? So I'm a 25 year old female from Eastern Europe. Just to give you a bit of background, I live in a country that is classed as a post-Soviet, as we used to be part of the Soviet Union until it collapsed. Currently, I'm in my final year of police training, me specifically training to become a detective in the murder-slash-organized crime cases. Throughout my training, I've seen a lot of gruesome things in cases, read a lot of past cases that are now solved, so to say, that I'm not breaking any law by talking about. Back in the 1990s, right after the Soviet Union had collapsed, small countries that were now independent were trying to set up their governments and law enforcement systems. People were mostly poor and organized crimes started to arise. And by that, I mean a lot of mafia groups were forming in various bigger cities, as there was no effective law enforcement to stop them from doing crimes, and the units that were formed were mostly corrupted and afraid of the mafia. Lucky me, I was born in one of the cities that had one of the strongest and influential mafia gangs in the whole country. The time from the 1990s until the early 2000s was like one big crime scene in the whole of the country. Daily shootings, corpse and rivers, robberies, carjackings, you name it, it was there. During my early training years in 2018 as part of my studies, I went to the police archive and I came across a few cases from the past that will stay in my mind for some time. I'll tell you about one of them in my story. So the case story goes like this. In 1992, early autumn when it was still warm, a young man went suddenly missing. Police knew that he had some ties with local mob, but for a week they weren't able to find him or his body. Right then, when the search was going on, three teenage boys aged 12 to 14 went fishing at a local river. To give you a better idea of the location, there was a main road. By that main road, there was a school and there was a trail leading through the school's playground right to the riverbank. It was a three minute walk from the playground to the riverbank, so the boys took their fishing gear, and as they were walking through the playground, they saw him wave hello to the school's principal as he was outside talking to a groundskeeper. 
boys being known for their mischievous behavior in school and just wanted to taunt the principal by waving at him. He ignored them and the boys went to the river. It was a warm evening. The sun was still up, it was around 5 p.m. The boys got ready to fish and cast their rods. Ten minutes passed and nothing. Fifteen minutes passed, nothing. One of the boys got impatient and decided to recast his rod. Just as he started to reel back, something heavy was on the line. He got excited and started to shout that he got a bite, a big one. The other boys ran to him and excitedly waited for the huge fish to finally show. But instead, as he was reeling, their faces went ash pale. There was no fish on the line. Instead, the fishing hook got stuck on flesh, human flesh. The boy who was holding the fishing rod threw up and when he saw that he had caught a human head, yes, a rotten human head that still had flesh on it, the boy panicked. They didn't know what to do as there were no cell phones and the closest building with an adult was the school. The boys dropped their fishing gear and ran back to the school hoping to find the principal who they saw earlier. He was nowhere to be seen outside, so the boys ran into the school straight into his office. They were panicking and screaming to the principal to come and there was something horrible in the river. The principal looked at them confused and refused to come as he thought that this was one of their pranks. But when he noticed how greenish pale and panicked they were, he said in a serious voice, This better not be one of your silly pranks. Now come on, show me what's going on. They took him right where they dropped their fishing gear and showed him the head which still had this fish hook stuck in it. The principal stood in silence but... There was a look of pure terror on his face. Quickly he took the boys back to his office and rang the police. The police came, of course, the forensics team was called to the scene. Statements were taken from the boys and the principal. It was the missing man's head. The 22-year-old man who was killed by the mob because he owed them money, then cut into separate pieces and thrown into the river. Only his head and torso were recovered, and his family was gutted. They couldn't even bury his body properly. Me, now reading their statement after more than 20 years, it brought me to tears. How terrible it must have been for the boys to discover the man's head and for the man's family to hear that their son has been discovered in parts. I'm not a faint-hearted person or anything like that, as I chose my career to be a murder detective, but some cases and witness statements who are crying their souls out asking to find the people who did that to their loved ones sometimes get me crying also. This just gave me motivation and strength to find and fight these horrible people. Stay safe, everyone. I live in a small town in South Africa. Near my town there's a large patch of woods and since the outbreak of the virus I haven't been in the woods for a long time, until yesterday. So my friend called me to ask me if I wanted to join him and a few of my mates to play a game of paintball in the woods and obviously I was keen. I got my paintball gear and gun and headed off to my mate's place. There were six of us, Chase, Liam, Matt, Joey, Steven and obviously me. We headed off to the woods but made a few stops to fill up on petrol and get some gas for the paintball guns. When we finally got to the woods we parked the cars, got into our gear and ventured out into the forest to find the perfect spot to paintball. Eventually, we got deep enough into an area with sufficient cover and space to play a good game of capture the flag. We played a couple of games and since it was winter, it got dark really quickly but we planned for this and brought our flashlights and decided to play a couple of night games which is extremely hard especially in the forest we were in. During one match, Joey and I decided to sit out because we were both tired and just needed a quick breather and the others continued to play from a significantly good distance away from us. While we were chilling, I was rolling up a joint, and Joey went to go take a pee a couple of meters away from me. While I was busy rolling, I had the flashlight pointing towards myself since there was no other light to allow me to see what I was doing and around me. It was completely dark. I couldn't even see two meters ahead of myself because of how dark it was. Suddenly I heard footsteps coming my way, but my thought it was Joey and I soon realized I couldn't see any light from his flashlight. So now I was more vigilant but still relaxed, thinking he was trying to play a prank on me or something. But the footsteps stopped a few meters away from me so I lifted my flashlight and pointed it in the direction where I heard the footsteps 
and scanned the area but just saw bushes and trees and thought that it might be Joey hiding in the bushes or behind a tree waiting to give me a jump scare. Then I heard footsteps coming in the opposite direction and when I looked, I could see it was Joey because he was holding his flashlight. That's when I stopped what I was doing and picked up my flashlight and paintball gun and when Joey reached me I whispered, Bro, I think there's someone over there. And Joey obviously didn't believe me and just said to stop being a baby, but he soon regretted saying that because I decided to do one last scan of where I heard the footsteps. And to my horror, I saw someone peeking and staring right at me from behind a tree, probably 10 or 11 meters away from us. I just shouted and when Joey heard me say this, he looked at me and then where the man looked and instantly jumped up picking up his paintball gun also. We stared at each other for at least two minutes, but it felt like forever until we stepped out from behind the tree. He was a large man, at least six foot, was honestly filthy like he hasn't taken a bath in years. He was wearing baggy ripped up jeans, just an old dirty zipped up bomber jacket, plus we could see that he was on something, or he was just crazy, and he was holding something behind his back. He finally said, What are you doing out here when it's so dark? We couldn't even answer him because of the shock we were in. Joey stuttered with fear in his voice. We were just leaving. But the man nodded his head in disagreement and said, No, you're not. Your friends are still playing the game. I felt a shiver down my spine. How about we play a game on our own while we wait for your friends? And this is when he finally showed us what he was hiding behind his back. A large machete. And that's when I knew we had to get out of there. I aimed my paintball gun at him in the toughest way I could muster up and I told him, leave now or I'll shoot. Even though I only had about six or seven paintballs loaded, and Joey did the exact same thing by aiming his gun at the man, even though he had no paintballs in his gun, but he didn't even flinch, but did something that honestly made my skin crawl. He just smiled and said, the game starts now. And suddenly he rushed at us, so I told Joey to run while I fired my last bullets at him and luckily I shot him in the head which caused him to fall so that that was our last chance to book it and link up with our other friends. As soon as we started running I heard footsteps again and he actually was gaining on us. We could barely see but we couldn't slow down because we knew what would happen if we did so we just carried on sprinting our hearts out until we heard other paintball guns being fired so we knew we were close. Joey started shouting to get everyone's attention and all of a sudden I heard a huge thud. Joey tripped and twisted his ankle. I turned around to help him but when I did, I could see the man running full sprint towards us. In that moment I thought it was going to be the end for us but our friends heard our screams for help and rushed to us and when they saw the man, they all just started firing at him. He knew he wasn't going to be able to take us all and he decided to turn around and disappear into the woods. We helped Joey up, rushed to get our stuff, and rushed to the cars. When we got to my friend's place, we helped Joey treat his ankle, and I proceeded to tell my friends everything that happened, and they were wildly creeped out, even in disbelief. It's safe to say that the next time I'm in those woods, we'll be much more vigilant. This happened in 2018. My girlfriend at the time and I decided to go camping in Patrick's Point. As we rolled up to pay for our site, we saw these signs warning against mountain lions in the area and what to do. We were just joking about how funny they look and captioning them to say moonwalk or attempt to fly away, offer your firstborn child, stuff like that. This was our first big mistake. We chose a heavily wooded site with a cove and lots of tree cover. We then hiked Wedding Rock, came back, made a nice fire and cooked grilled cheese and soup. All in all, a great evening. As we were chilling by the fire, a fat skunk waddled out. My girlfriend is terrified of skunks, so I'm trying to shoo it while she hunkers in the car, but this plump little guy was not afraid. Eventually, after eating some grubs, it waddled past our tent into the bush. My girlfriend was dead set on sleeping in the car, but I convinced her everything would be fine and shone my flashlight all around our tent, 
proving this smelly little guy was gone for the night. So we curl up in our one-man coffin tent, have some loud fun, and after we close our eyes to sleep, lulled by the roars of waves crashing off the surrounding cliffs, just as we're about to sleep, we hear cracking of twigs. No big deal, probably the skunk dude, followed by a bone-chilling scream coming from a few feet away. We are now frozen, completely silent except for our ridiculously loud heartbeats. Did you hear that? I whisper. Yeah, what do we do? She replied. We held each other thinking maybe if we are still it will lose interest and move. No luck, as now we hear it circling our large sardine can of doom. Should we scream? She peeps. Before the words can leave her mouth, I yell in the manliest voice I can, trying to be intimidating. She joins me, our voices louder than a foghorn. Now, this cat is thinking tasty snack, all wrapped up, and sounds like an injured deer. Yay. So the circling has tightened around us, and we can see shadows of its silhouette above us. We need light, we agree. So with one arm over her stomach, I slowly reach over my head in this claustrophobic space, grab the flashlight while clicking it on, and as I bring my arm back down to my side, my elbow grazes its nose pressed against the tent. Dear God. Without pause or thought, I flipped around, my back pressed on top of my girlfriend, and kick as hard as I can, shouting. The first kick blindly landed right on the side of the lion's face, and the two subsequent kicks hit nothing, just tore the tent open. Faced by darkness and the uncertainty of whether I would be mauled, I rose out of our mangled doggy bag, pulling my girlfriend behind me, back to back. There was nothing in the clearing, so we slowly walked back to the car, illuminating the brush around us. This all started around 1.30, and we made it to the car at 2.15. We did have to go back for our phones after maybe an hour of pure adrenaline pumping through our veins. Nothing came of it, so once we were chill enough to lie down, we did, falling asleep by around 5 a.m. The next morning, we got our food out of the bear box, grabbed our remaining stuff, and looked for tracks. Right next to the tent, about a foot from where my head was, there was a scuffle print in the dirt. We packed up, made our exodus, and stopped by the ranger station where we finally noticed the other less amusing sign next to the aforementioned one warning of a problem mountain lion in the area. We filled out our report and got home safe. But dear God, two small women against a 200 pound cat. We're lucky we didn't get mauled. My uncle was a sheriff's deputy and a search and rescue officer in the northwest United States back in the 90s. This experience is told from my uncle's view with a few explanations from myself. He asked that I keep the location hidden for anonymity purposes. So it was the summer of 1992. I was a couple of years into my job with the county sheriff's office. Summers were busy. A ton of people would go camping up here, so naturally people would occasionally get lost. Search and rescue was something I was voluntold to do as a rookie, but I learned to love it. Helping people, especially in life or death situations, was the reason I became a deputy. So search and rescue gave me that rush, as my normal law enforcement duties were almost always mundane in my small town. We received a call from a lady in Arizona one Tuesday morning. She claimed her husband and young grandson had driven up here on Friday for a weekend camping trip. They hadn't returned Monday, as scheduled, and she was worried that they were lost. So we geared up in the search and rescue team consisting of myself, four other deputies, 15 civilian volunteers, and two bloodhound s &R dogs. We made it to their camping site at around noon. Upon first inspection, everything in the camp seemed relatively normal. We searched their tent and found all their belongings sitting inside. Truck keys, wallet, map, water, food, all sat in the tent undisturbed. A small pot filled with water and now extra soggy macaroni noodles sat above a long dead fire pit. It was obvious they had left in a hurry. No tracks were visible to determine what direction they went, so we used a pair of socks we found inside the tent as a base smell for the hounds. They caught the scent and started leading us north of the campsite. 
As we walked, I looked at my partner and we both shook and lowered our heads. North of their campsite was tens of thousands of acres of dense woods. We knew this was going to be a long search. As we searched, we used a grid pattern. A grid pattern is roughly an acre-sized square on a map that search and rescue used to determine a more precise direction that someone might have gone. The weirdest part was that the hounds would pick up on their scent in one square, but not any of the squares directly next to that square. This happened multiple times. It was as if someone plucked these guys up from their campsite and placed them in random sections of the forest repeatedly. I began to get a very bad feeling after this. Something just didn't seem right about the situation. The team had covered roughly three miles of area as the day started to wind down. As dusk began to hit, it was just myself, my buddy Rob, and his hound Russ that stayed behind. The rest of the team made their way back home and would be back out tomorrow morning. I always stayed out overnight when a child was lost. I had a feeling of guilt being in a warm, safe bed while a child was cold and scared out in the wilderness. We eventually found a small clearing to make camp. By the time night fell, we had a fire blazing and our sleeping bags laid out in the grass. Rob and I went over the next day's search plan for a bit, ate dinner, and eventually hunkered down for the evening. I laid on my sleeping bag and quickly dozed off. I woke up some time later. I sat up and looked around as my eyes began to adjust to the darkness. I felt like someone was watching me. The urge to look around to ensure no one was sneaking up on me was intense. I called out. Hello? Sam? Frank, is that you? We're looking for you, are you there? I didn't hear any response, so I lay down and tried to fall back asleep. Just a few minutes later, I heard it. Somewhere to my left, past the tree line, came a loud wolf whistle. Uncle does the wolf whistle. A uh, wolf whistle is the whistle you hear in movies or TV when a man sees a very attractive woman. I sprang up out of my sleeping bag and began frantically scanning the tree line. At this point, Russ was up too. His ears were peeking and he was whining in the direction of the whistle. I called out again. Hello? I'm a deputy with the sheriff's office. Do you need help? Sam? Frank? I received no response. Rob was awake now, and as I was explaining the situation, the whistle came again. Uncle whistles, but this time to our right. I drew my sidearm and flickered my flashlight as Rob took out his large buck knife and stood beside me. We scanned the tree line, but we didn't see anything. We continued scanning the tree line and calling out for another ten minutes before we decided to get the fire going again and wait until dawn to search the area. We didn't hear another whistle for the remainder of the morning. As dawn broke, Rob and I searched the area. We found two pairs of boot prints in the fresh mud. We decided to head back home, get some rest, and return later in the day to continue searching. We were only about 200 feet from the clearing when two simultaneous wolf whistles came from behind us. As I turned, I scanned the areas, scanned the trees. I didn't see anything at first, but as I looked further back towards the entrance to the clearing, I saw two silhouettes standing out in the open. We couldn't see any features or clothing as the morning sun was blinding us. I called out and started making my way towards them when they took off running. I was going to chase them when Rob stopped me. I was puzzled. I responded, Rob, what? We're looking for two people and there they are. Stop wasting time, man. He replied, Stop and think for a second. We're looking for one male adult and one male child. Unless that kid is the next Randy Brewer, there's no way he's that tall at age 11. That's when the realization hit me. He was right. Those till silhouettes were not the two people we were searching for. If I was alone or with another deputy, I would have chased them, but I wasn't willing to put a civilian volunteer in danger. We decided to just continue our way back to the trailhead and debrief the team and sheriff on the events that transpired. The rest of the hike back to the trailhead was uneventful. We met up with the search team and the sheriff when we arrived as they were getting geared up to head back out. We received a few scoffs and eye rolls when retelling the events that occurred, but the sheriff surprisingly believed our claims. He had one of the deputies carry an M16 for the remainder of the search. We continued to search for 13 days, never finding the two missing individuals. A few people claimed they heard wolf whistles while out searching, but 
I never did again. This mission still haunts me. I've wondered all these years what happened to those two and if the two silhouettes had something to do with their disappearance. There was an annual festival in my city. I decided to go with my twin friends of mine. Their dad, two male friends I knew, and two other male friends who came along as well. It was a fun evening except for the two guys I didn't know. They were sort of friends with the twins. It's a long time ago so I don't remember how they knew each other. I was wearing a long dark blue dress. All throughout the evening these guys gave me a bad feeling to be around. I hung around the twins and the two guys I knew to avoid them. These dudes asked for my Facebook at one point and because I have a little bit of a difficult name to spell they couldn't find me, fortunately. They apparently talked about me because my dress was mentioned as a reference and that started to creep me out. They were sort of whispering to each other and that's something that stood out of the conversation. I knew I definitely did not want to be alone with any of them. So I avoid these creeps as best I can and it works. I didn't know the twin girls were kind of into them. I wasn't a fan of that since they gave me such a bad vibe. At one point though one of the twins went to get something to eat alone with one of the dudes. I didn't trust it but it also wasn't my decision. They came back a little while later with food and that was the end of the night. Everyone got home safely and had a good time. A few weeks later my suspicions about the shady dudes were confirmed to be true. It came out that the girl who was alone with one of them to get food had apparently been indecently assaulted. It's absolutely terrible that, that it happened to her, but I'm just grateful that I listened to my gut and stayed away from them. My name is Courtney Bradshaw. I'm a truck driver and a single mom. I spend most of my time on the road. I sometimes dream that I'm driving on the highway. Being a woman trucker is rough. I have to transport cargo alone at night. Going to rest stops and roadside diners can be a little nerve-wracking. I get a lot of stares from guys. Sometimes I like the attention and other times it gets annoying. I've never been able to sit down and truly eat at a diner without being flirted with. I ate at a diner one night without being bothered and that's because the diner was near closing time. I guess it's the way I look. Most people don't believe I'm a truck driver. They see my blonde hair, my so-called pretty face, and my cute little figure and they assume that I work at a nail salon or I'm a flight attendant. They even think I'm a model sometimes. I met one guy who thought I was a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. I guess it was my southern accent and my Dallas Cowboys baseball cap that I like to wear all the time. My teenage son told me that Men flirt with me because I look like Britney Spears. He knows Britney Spears is old-fashioned, but it's the only way he can describe his mom's beauty. I think it's funny and cute. My son's name is Aaron. He's named after his father. My son misses his father a lot. I can remember watching the two of them playing video games or out in the backyard playing football together. Aaron Bradshaw Sr., my husband, died from a drug overdose seven years ago. I adored my husband, and I actually did drugs with him. Both of us would get high on fentanyl and other types of opioids now and then. Every day I feel guilty because I think about how I enabled my husband. My sweetheart would be alive today if I had stopped doing drugs with him. We both would have gone to rehab together. But it was just me going to rehab after my husband's death. My son is like a spitting image of my husband. He has his father's good looks. He has his square jawline and his father's gorgeous ocean blue eyes. A lot of girls love my son because of his looks. I love him because he's my angel. Every time I look at him, it's like my husband never died. My son is 17 now. That means my baby is a man now and he's got himself a girlfriend. Does that make me jealous sometimes since I'm an overbearing mom? Of course. I'm sure you moms out there know what I'm talking about, especially if you have a boy who's growing up fast. You can't cradle him anymore because he's gotten so tall and bulky. He's the quarterback on his high school football team. You know he'll be going away to college soon. When he was little, you were the only one who got his affection because you were his mother. But soon he'll get married to a woman who's going to steal all his affection away from you. My son's girlfriend has already gotten started. But hey, that's the life of being a mom. 
and sometimes you gotta let it go. My son still loves me because he calls me while I'm on the road sometimes. If I'm delivering a load at night and my son calls me, I don't feel nervous. I love it when he calls during a lonely drive. That's when I need his company the most. Two nights ago, I needed my son's company more than anything. I'm a reefer driver. A reefer driver is someone who operates a truck with a refrigerated load. I spend most of my nights delivering fresh food and frozen goods to grocery store retailers. Reefer truckers mostly have to do early morning deliveries. That means you have to do a lot of late night driving. The good part about being a reefer truck driver is you earn more money, especially when you have to do a long haul. I love my job and my paycheck, but what happened to me two nights ago almost made me quit my job. Have you heard about haunted highways? I'm sure you have. Haunted highways or roads are streets that are subject of folklore and urban legends. You hear reports of ghostly apparitions, phantom hitchhikers, and phantom vehicles being seen on a haunted highway. In my case, I had a run-in with a ghostly apparition and a phantom vehicle. It was around 3.15 a.m. I was heading east on a road called Sweet Hollow. Sweet Hollow Road intersects with another road called Mount Misery. Both roads are near a town called Melville in Long Island, New York. I enjoy driving on town roads sometimes instead of taking the highways because it's quieter. But on this night, something told me not to drive down Sweet Hollow Road. I had that voice in the back of my head that gave me a foreboding and I ignored it. If you make it out of a dangerous situation, you look back and you think, why did I ignore that voice? It's stupid. I've heard stories about Sweet Hollow Road and Mount Misery Road being the two most haunted roads in America, but of course I didn't believe it. The townspeople warned drivers not to go down Sweet Hollow or Mount Misery Road. My smart self here thought the warnings were ridiculous. I laughed off the warnings and the horror stories. I should have known something was wrong when I saw no other cars on the road. It was just me and my truck that night. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, so I figured that's why there were no other cars on the road. The stories I heard about Sweet Hollow Road involved accidental deaths, murders, and people taking their life. I heard about a young woman who was killed by her jealous boyfriend. They said that her boyfriend threw her out of a moving car, and another car struck her and killed her. I don't want to go into all the stories I've heard, but it was some really dark stuff. The one tragic story that broke my heart the most was about a group of children who died on a school bus while traveling down Sweet Hollow. I heard a lot of tragic tales and a lot of ghostly encounter stories. My first encounter with something supernatural happened when I was driving toward the North State Overpass Bridge of Sweet Hollow. It was dark, and I saw this mist rising from the road. My truck's headlights did the best they could, but I still had a little trouble trying to see through this strange mist that intensified when I got closer to the bridge. When I drove under the overpass, it got darker and the mist became thicker. I made it halfway into the bridge and that's when it started. I could see the moonlight coming in through the other side of the overpass, but I saw the moonlight reflecting off of something. It took me a second to notice that someone was standing under the overpass on the other side, and they were standing right in the middle of the road. I slowed my truck down and brought it to a stop about 50 feet away from the mysterious figure. The strange part is, is that the mist cleared, allowing me to get a better look at the figure. Also, my truck's headlights helped me. When I got a better look at that, I saw that it was a teenage boy. I could say that he was no older than my son. I figured maybe he got lost or separated from his friends. Maybe he was partying a little too hard and got disoriented on his way home. In my mind, there was nothing scary about the situation. It was just a kid who needed help. I've always thought of myself as a brave woman. I'm also a mom, so I guess you could say those motherly instincts kicked in when I saw the teenager just standing in the road. Without thinking about it, I opened the door before climbing down out of my truck's cabin. Are you alright, honey? Did you need some help? Are you lost? I shouted to the boy, but he didn't answer me. He never moved. I wanted to approach him, but I heard that voice again telling me to stay near my truck. The boy was standing a good distance away from me. I knew I would have to walk far from my truck before I could see face to face with him. I called out to the boy again, but he still didn't answer. He stood so perfectly still under the overpass. He looked like a statue. 
And like I said before, I've always thought to myself as a brave woman, but this kind of gave me the creeps. Seeing the boy standing there under the bridge like a statue isn't what made me get back in my truck. It's when the lights on my truck mysteriously began flickering on and off when I looked at the boy. His body vanished when my truck's lights went out. That pretty much settled it for me, and I hurried up and got myself back in my truck. I didn't want to believe what I saw, and I also didn't want to believe that my truck's engine had cut off on its own. I couldn't start it back up. My truck was practically brand new, so this worried me. While I was trying to start my truck back up again, I locked all my doors. It took a few minutes, but I finally got my truck started. When I turned the headlights on, my heart went into my mouth when I saw the boy reappear, but this time there were two other boys with him. I turned my headlights off and the boy would disappear. I kept thinking that maybe I was hallucinating from lack of sleep and that all my hours of late night driving had finally caught up with me. I kept turning my headlights on and off. Every time I would do it, the three boys would appear under the overpass, staring back at me. But when I turned my truck's headlights off again and turned them back on for the last time, I saw something that I know will give me nightmares for the rest of my life. I waited for a minute before turning my headlights back on and when I did, I saw the three boys, but they weren't standing in the road this time. Their bodies were hanging from the overpass. I watched in horror as their bodies swung from the ropes tied to the bridge. It scared me so badly that I shut off my truck's headlights while screaming. When I turned off my headlights, I thought the horrible sight would disappear, but I still saw the boys hanging from the bridge in the dark. I closed my eyes while gripping the steering wheel, hoping I was imagining it. When I opened my eyes, they were still there, swaying back and forth. My truck's engine died again, but what made me panic was when I looked to see two boys hanging from the overpass instead of three. The third boy was on the ground, and it didn't take long to see that he was slowly dragging his feet toward my truck. He was distant in the darkness, but I could still see him removing the rope from around his neck. I could see that he was creeping in my direction, but my eyes kept telling me not to believe what I was seeing. I had to get my truck started. I couldn't believe that I was seeing the ghost of three boys who had taken their own lives, and now one of them was alive, edging his way toward my truck. No matter how many times I turned the key, I couldn't get my truck to start. The boy got close enough to where I could make out his clothes. I saw his denim shorts and a grungy white tank top. What made me lose my breath was seeing what his body would do every time he'd take a step toward my truck. He would jerk and contort like someone having a seizure. My truck's headlights were on and I could see the boy's face. He reminded me of my boy if he was dead. There was no life in his face. He had nothing but a dull and dark expression. His mouth hung open slightly and what scared me the most were his eyes. He had no pupils. All he could see were the whites of his eyes. His movements reminded me of a puppet on a string. It looked like I was watching an evil spirit learn how to walk using a teenage boy's body. I kept turning the ignition switch praying that God would let me start my truck. I panicked when I heard the truck's doors unlock themselves. I had locked the doors but they would keep unlocking themselves as if though they had a mind of their own. At first, I thought the mechanism that controlled my truck's automatic doors had malfunctioned. I couldn't keep the doors locked, no matter how many times I pressed the button. Now I was torn between getting my truck started and struggling to keep my doors locked. And Lord knows, I didn't want a ghost or whatever this thing was climbing into my truck's cabin. At one point, I considered jumping out of my truck and taking to running on foot. But I knew it was too late to run when I saw the boy getting closer to my driver's side door. I knew screaming wouldn't save me, but I did it anyway. I cried out to God and my truck's door opened. I grabbed the door handle and I tried to pull it shut. I couldn't believe I was playing tug of war with an evil spirit. I kept yelling the word stop repeatedly. I even said, please stop ghost. I guess you're in shock and anything will come out of your mouth. The ghost kept pulling on my door and I could see his dull white eyes staring up at me through the driver's side window. It seemed like the more I would yell stop, the harder he would pull on the door. I was pulling back on the door with my hands but I couldn't keep the door shut. This monster tried to overpower me and at one point he mockingly smirked at me while yanking my door back open. He only needed one hand to pull my door open while I had to use both my hands to keep it shut. 
and I thought the devil was at my driver's side door. All I kept seeing was his dead white eyes and his sadistic smile. I couldn't let him in. I had to keep my door shut. And with all my strength, I tried to keep my door closed and I refused to let go. I had my hands glued to my door handle because I knew if I didn't keep my hands on the door, something bad would happen to me. I fought with the ghostly apparition and I tried to ignore his dull gaze. Sweat poured down my face. My bra was sticking to my breasts. I thought my heartbeat was going to fracture my chest bone. I kept telling myself that I would wake up. My fear meter went through the roof when I looked to see that the other two dead bodies that were hanging from the overpass were now on the ground, strolling toward my truck. Now I had all three dead boys to deal with. The other dead boys were walking faster than the first boy, and they still had the ropes around their necks. One boy had a broken neck. I could tell by the way he held his head, his forehead touched his shoulder. The other teenage boy walked with his shoulders slumped over and his legs convulsed and twisted every time he took a step, which almost made him look like a break dancer. Dealing with one was bad enough. I could barely handle one and I knew I wouldn't be able to handle all three of them. Death was on the horizon for me. I could feel it and I kept thinking that maybe God was punishing me for doing drugs with my husband and enabling him to be a drug addict. God was going to let me die at the hands of three ghostly apparitions. Judgment. The other two ghostly boys wasted no time shortening the distance between themselves and my truck. They were closer and I could see my death arising with every step they took. I kept begging myself to wake up but I couldn't escape from the dead boys. They wanted me. I kept hearing the horror stories of people getting killed by something supernatural. These were stories I didn't believe were true until now. I believed in the paranormal that night, but I knew my belief in the paranormal wouldn't save me. I needed a miracle, some kind of divine intervention. I prayed to God asking him to help me. I never saw a ghost before and it made me question my reality. My arms were getting tired from trying to hold on to the door. I was about to accept my fate until something happened. My phone started ringing. I looked around at my phone which was sitting on top of my purse and I knew it was my son calling me. When I turned back around the boy at my door vanished. The other two boys vanished too. Even my truck started back up on its own. When I locked the doors they didn't unlock themselves. I didn't know what to do next. I didn't know whether to drive or answer my phone. I planned to do both. I wanted to get away from that bridge. Do you know how it feels when the muscles in your body lock up after you've had a traumatic experience? That's what happened to me for a minute. For about a minute I just sat there holding my ringing phone like a moron. That voice in my head yelled at me and it told me to get moving because something else was coming. To make it easy on myself I answered my phone and I put my son on speaker so I wouldn't have to hold my phone. I shifted my truck into gear and got out of that bridge. It felt so good to hear my son's voice. I could hear his rap music playing in the background, and it also felt good to feel my truck moving again. When I finally drove out of the overpass, I looked into the side mirror and saw the boys again, hanging from the bridge. I quickly turned my eyes away. I kept both my hands on the steering wheel and my eyes locked on the road. My son could hear the fear in my voice. He asked what was wrong, and I lied to him and told him that I was just tired. I couldn't tell him what happened. I didn't want him to think his mom was a lunatic. There was a strong temptation inside of me though. I wanted to tell him but I thought it would be better to wait and tell him while we were together. Maybe he'd believe me if I told him over the dinner table instead of telling him over the phone. I couldn't figure out how to tell him what I saw. How could I explain it to him? Hi baby, how was school? Oh yeah and by the way your mother got attacked by ghosts while she was driving her truck last night. Yeah, that sounded credible. He'd believe that, wouldn't he? Yeah, sure he would. He'd never suspect that his mother might be mentally ill. My god, I couldn't drive my truck fast enough. I wanted to get off a of sweet hollow road. There were no street lights, no traffic lights, no cars. There was nothing but fog and a long, dark and narrow road that seemed to go on forever. Tree branches hung over the road like giant claws with leaves on them. I kept talking to my son. His voice was my therapy. I loved listening to him tell me his dreams of becoming an NFL star and that he planned to buy his mom a new house and a nice car. Listening to my son's dreams calmed my nerves. 
talking to my son made me forget that I was driving down a haunted road. And after a while, I forgot about the three boys near the overpass. I forgot about Sweet Hollow Road. And my mind made me believe that maybe I hallucinated the whole thing. Or that I fell asleep at the wheel and just had a terrible, terrible nightmare. I met Brad when I was 18 years old and in a pretty low part of my life. I'm not changing his name because he doesn't deserve it. Brad was a manipulative, lying narcissist. I had a lot of low self-esteem issues and I was desperate to feel loved. He zeroed in on this weakness instantly. We became inseparable and we jumped right into the I love yous. Brad saw me for the gullible idiot that I was and that I would accept any behavior from him as long as they offered me love. He lied constantly. He told me he had a car, a very fancy car, but it was in the shop in one of the nearby bigger cities. He said he worked on a farm as a helper. For a while, he would leave for the day, claiming to be going to work. However, he quit pretty much as soon as we started dating. I don't think he had a job at all. He was just cruising, looking for girls that he could sponge off of, and I fit the bill. My roommates hated him, which I wish I had seen those red flags too, but at the time... I just thought that they were being unsupportive. They found a new place to rent without me and stole my portion of the security deposit. I thought I really only had one choice, move in with Brad even though we had only been dating a month or two. Early in the relationship I got a message from a fake Facebook account. I could tell it was fake because there was only one picture and no friends on the profile. It was a girl asking me if Brad had ever hurt me. I was confused and asked him about it. He said it was an ex that was out to ruin his life and sabotage any relationship he had, and I stupidly believed him ignored the warnings. We rented a really terrible basement suite, it was really all I could afford. Once we were actually living together, he let all the red flags fly. I tried my best to ignore them, hoping that this would work out. I couldn't afford to live alone. I was in college and my parents lived in a different town so I couldn't move back in with them. We had a very strained relationship and I didn't ever want to ask them for help or admit to them that I had made a mistake. Brad made me think it was completely normal to have no privacy. He could look at my phone anytime the urge hit him and he became enraged if I was in contact with any guys. He had huge blow-ups over everything. He had this job and he would borrow my car and leave the house for a full eight hours. He drove my car hard, doing brake stands and drifting in empty parking lots. He warped my brake pads so badly that they would skip when you tried to stop at a stoplight. One time, I was driving him somewhere before class. I was telling him that even though I could drop him off, I could not come pick him up because I had a group project to work on and my group was meeting after class. He wanted me to leave the car, but I couldn't do that because the college was very far from where I was dropping him off. We got into it and he started punching my dashboard over and over, cracking and breaking it. I was so scared that I bailed on my group to pick him up. All my group members were really mad at me, but I was too scared to not do what he asked. A few nights he went missing with my car. He had excuses that his phone died and he had been drinking so he couldn't drive. Despite leaving every day for work, he always had some excuse for why he couldn't chip in on rent. He couldn't help me pay for food. His boss either messed up his check or was just about to come. At one point, he had had some money. I insisted he needed to give me some of it to help me pay for rent and food. He gave me $40 and it was a huge fight. I started keeping a running tally on our fridge of how much money he owed for his portion of the bills. This was a focal point for daily fights that we had. For his birthday, his grandma got us a $200 gift card for our local grocery store. I was so hopeful to actually be able to afford food, real food and not just canned soup. Unfortunately, this store also sold cell phones at the time. He spent the entire gift card on getting a new phone. This was before smartphones, so phones were not as expensive back then. I was in college and I worked a lot. One night he called me. Babe, someone broke into our house. I just got home and everything's a complete mess. All our stuff is thrown everywhere. And I rushed home. Everything was exactly as I left it. He said he had cleaned up everything because he didn't want me to worry. The only thing that was missing was the $40 he had given me towards the month of free rent and food that had been sponging off of me. 
I didn't have much value to be stolen, but the TV, the outdated game system I had, and all my games and CDs were still there. I was instantly suspicious, but I refused to believe that the love of my life would do this to me. I just willed everything to get better. I kept telling myself, soon things will work out and he would help me with the bills. This was all temporary, I told myself. The fear of being alone outweighed my suspicions. He would send me threatening texts throughout the day. I was in class and I got a text, where are you? I'm in class, I responded. I don't believe you, I'm coming to school looking for you. I looked everywhere and I didn't see you. The college I went to wasn't massive, but it was still a good size enough. With enough students in classrooms, it would be very difficult to just randomly find one person out of hundreds. He accused me of lying at being school and that I was actually cheating on him when I said I was in class. Once, I had an exam that had to be at the school at a certain time to do. He accused me of lying and that I was just trying to leave to cheat on him. He blocked the door and refused to let me leave. I waited until he calmed down. I think he went to the bathroom or something and I made a break for it. Just as I was in my car and driving away, he came running out of the house, chasing me. His eyes were terrifying. The rage was so intense. I got to my exam, over an hour late and bawling my eyes out. When we had first started dating, he told me that he had had a child. In the time that we were together, he almost never talked about his kid and I never met the child either. At one point, he told me they had gotten a call from the mother and that his child died in some kind of accident. He did a great job of acting distraught and upset. However, I found it weird we never went to a funeral, that he had never had any details of what had actually happened. He completely stopped talking about it right away. I asked his sister about the death and she in no uncertain terms told me that there was no way the child was dead and she talked to the mother very recently. So he was lying about the death on his own kid, probably planning on completely cutting off his responsibilities with this lie. He got a night job, clearing snow for store parking lots. He would only work if it had snowed. We were out one night and he got very drunk. I asked him if he had to work because the snow was coming down hard. He was pretty much out of commission, unable to walk or hold a conversation. I feared he would lose his job too, so I asked him if he wanted me to check his phone to see if his boss had messaged him. He agreed and handed over his phone. There was no text from his boss. However, there were tons of messages from women. A lot of these messages included pictures. I'm sure without me getting into too much detail that you could figure out what kind of pictures he was being sent. I saw one text from an unsaved number. All it said was, is your girlfriend home? He only sent one response, no, come over. I was ready to break up with him. He came up with some excuse that girls just sent him photos unsolicited. This was made somewhat believable because he was not responding to the pictures. He said that the girl who texted him was a friend who had a deformity and that she was too shy to meet me, but they had been friends for years. I didn't believe him. He took our block of knives into the bathroom, locking the door. He told me that he would end his own life if I didn't stay with him, and like an idiot, I feared for his life and took him back. Things did not last much longer though. He started getting mad that when I got home I would say hello to my cats before I'd say hello to him. He started insinuating that I loved the cats more than him and that I could not love anything more than I loved him or they would have to go. His parents dropped off his younger brother at our house for us to take care of while they went on vacation. Brad said that they hadn't given him any money for taking care of him, not even grocery money. On my payday, I went out and got some groceries, as well as I picked up a pizza for all of us to share. I thought it would be really nice because we had been living off of ramen and toast for months. I should mention here that I occasionally bought Brad cigarettes because, of course, he had no money. When I got home, he asked me if I would buy him cigarettes and I said no. I had had enough of him always mooching off of me and being the only one to pay for everything. I told him I couldn't afford to pay for his cigarettes anymore, and he lost his mind, gesturing to the pizza. You can afford this, but you can afford cigarettes for me. And I surprisingly stood my ground and refused. He went crazy. He threatened to leave. I told him to go right ahead. He got angry and threatened that he would take the cat that we had gotten together. I told him there was no way he was taking the cat and that he didn't have a place and he had no money, so how could he take care of a cat? He became livid and kicked the cat. It wasn't that hard. It probably scared her, but not enough to really hurt her. Still, this was the last straw for me. 
and I started screaming at him to get the F out. My rage finally outweighed my fear of him. He got really in my face, screaming insults at me. I was standing in front of a huge decorative mirror we had hanging on the wall. He had me cornered. He threw a punch, and I ducked. He shattered the mirror, a huge hole right where my head had been. Now I have to say I don't know if he had tried to actually punch me, or if he was just trying to frighten me, but I just screamed and screamed until he left. He finally did leave, probably thinking that the upstairs renter would call the police if I didn't stop screaming. Finally, I was free of him. However, I still had a few months on the lease, which thank God only had my name on it, and I did not have any more to afford the damaged deposit at a new place, so I had to continue living there for a few months after we broke up. I threw his shit on the lawn and told him to come get it and to never speak to me again. This didn't really stop him, though. I blocked his number and all of his social media. He started calling me from random numbers I didn't recognize. I picked up the first few calls, my stomach dropping when I found out it was him on the other end. Don't hang up. If you hang up, I'm going to end my life right here and now. I'll really do it. I had his parents' number and his sister's. I called all of them, but they wouldn't answer. Likely Brad had told them that I was the crazy one and did not believe anything I said. I simply left a voicemail, letting them know that Brad was continuously calling me and threatening to end his own life. They never returned my call, but the calls from Brad slowed. I started dating a new guy shortly after. I was still living in the same house though and Brad still knew where I lived. One day my boyfriend picked me up in his truck and as we were driving away I got a text from a number I didn't recognize. You look pretty today. I froze. I knew instantly it was him and that he was watching me. I ignored the text. A few minutes later I got another. I see you have a new boyfriend. I blocked the number. I don't remember if I told anyone about it actually. I was so happy when my lease was up and I moved to a new place so he wouldn't know where I lived anymore. I haven't seen Brad in years thankfully. I feel so sad for that version of myself that put up with all of that stuff just so that I would feel like someone loved me. I am mad at that version of myself too for not being stronger. Unfortunately that was not the end of the string of terrible people I dated. I fell for another manipulative narcissist very soon after. I wanted to write this and hope that if you are reading or hearing this, please know this behavior is not normal in a relationship. There are people out there who only see others for what they can do for them. They don't love anyone but themselves, and no matter how hard it is to leave, it's worth it, I promise you. After a lot of bad relationships that I did myself no favors by staying in, I have found a partner that treats me so well, he doesn't use me for what I can give him. I sometimes think it's so crazy, like this is what a good relationship is. Why couldn't I have seen that before? I would have saved myself a lot of heartache. I'm currently a 19 year old girl. The timing of these events span the years of my female development. I want to mention how I grew up because it affects my perception of the story and how, for about two years, I essentially ignored it, so apologies in advance. To start, I live and lived at the time of these events in the low country of South Carolina. This story revolves mainly around my neighbor at the time and what I believe he did. At the time of these events, I was around 12 to 16. I say this because the incidents didn't happen one after the other, but over time. Anyway, enough with the long-winded stuff, but to put it plainly, I physically developed a lot faster than my peers and happened to be, unfortunately, well endowed in the chesticle department and wasn't completely unfortunate looking. That being said, I was not fully developed until I was about 16 in that area, however, being well above average, it didn't matter what was there and what hadn't installed yet, I had already been given enough. Outside of multiple middle school creeps trying to poke at me or others, however, I'm happy to say that outside of these incidents I was relatively ignored. Of course, I wasn't fully ignored though, or else I wouldn't have the need to write this. So with the explanation out of the way, I'd like to say my neighbor was a failure of a man and a pitiful alcoholic. Outside of being a cop from Rhode Island, he was also a terrible husband who verbally abused his kids and wife. My family was never really on good terms with him, but things escalated after we called him out for throwing 
his dog poop in our front yard. Following a lovely display of his minimal intelligence in our front yard as he tried to threaten my 100% disabled dad, our relationship was something similar to the family feud of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. This guy would openly talk about my family to our other neighbors in the cul-de-sac and put what he thought was funny pranks on my family. One such example being burned pallets of cured wood because he knew it made my mom choke. Something else I should probably mention is that my mother had stage 4 metastatic cancer from about 2011 till her passing in 2019, and because of the chemotherapy she was undergoing at the time, her lung capacity had been drastically reduced. Outside of this, he liked to watch me. Being the naive 13-14 to 14 year old I was back then, I had no idea why he did it, only that my friends stopped coming over because it scared them and their parents. Over time, till I was about 15... His continual watching gradually wore me out. I stopped wearing anything tight-fitting and rarely would go outside unless I was with my sister, who was my fraternal twin, or a separate close friend of ours. It was only then that I'd noticed specific things happening only around me. The first of the odd stuff was when I would go outside on my back porch to sit and talk with my dad for hours on end and would get flashed and blinded by a flashlight being shown at me from my neighbor's bathroom window which had clear access to our patio. It got to the point that my mom even sewed curtains to put up around the patio. The last thing I can remember this happening was when I was taking the trash out one night and I was blinded from the right side coming from the direction of his house, directly following the sound of footsteps. A following incident that happened was the neighbor opening our gate closet to his house and letting our dogs loose. It took an hour to notice and I was thankful only my bigger dog got out. I remember seeing her at the opening of the cul-de-sac and just freaking out because she was still a bit of a puppy and was brindle running around in the dark. This could have been a mistake on our part granted but we hadn't used that gate for a week at that point so it was highly unlikely. The last incident was by far the worst. It was the opening night of the new Star Wars movie in 2015. My dad and I had just dropped off my brother and his girlfriend at the theater. When we had gotten back, my dad had gone upstairs to work on a model kit with my mom and he asked me if I could bring my mom a soda. So I did, as was told, and headed down the stairs to stop by another one of my dogs at the time. She was a half-blind old American Eskimo, barking her head off at the door. In the moment, I remember almost mindlessly looking at the door only to freeze when I noticed the jiggling handle. Very quietly, I remember walking to the door just as it stops. In hindsight, what I did next could have really turned to bite me in the butt, but my 14-year-old weeb brain convinced me that taking out our bowie knife we used for gardening and walking out the front door, waving it around, was a good idea. Not hearing or seeing anything, I turned around and asked my dad to come down and quietly told him what happened in an attempt to not stress my mom. My dad appreciated the thought but ended up telling her anyway and for the rest of the night my dad pretty much watched the door like a hawk. This was the last of the incidents, but it didn't really hit me until after my mom passed how creepy my neighbor was. Though I'm sure my dad telling me that he would talk about me in a perverse way didn't help me dealing with that to be honest. In all honesty, I know the story isn't exactly scary, more so than it is just troubling, but dealing with the side effects of being harassed for a good four years or so while being regularly harassed as well had been interesting and irritating at the same time. I just hope he has a very inconvenient lifestyle with a bunch of little bad things happening to him that he can't do anything about. Thanks for reading. On Halloween night back when I was in 8th grade, I'm 27 now, my friend Kayla and I were giddy with excitement, messing around and getting dressed up in our costumes. I'm not even going to say what we were for Halloween, it's just too cringy. But anyway, this night was a special night for us girls because this was going to be the last year for us to go trick-or-treating. We thought that once we became freshmen in high school, trick-or-treating would be too childish for the new cool high school students to be participating in. So, we were going all out, especially with the amount of candy, grabbing pillowcases that we planned to fill entirely. We practically skipped out my front door ready to begin in our opinion, the greatest night and holiday of the year. We didn't waste any time, going door to door, street after street, that we didn't even realize that hours had passed. 
Back during this time, the trick-or-treating time was a heck of a lot longer than the two to three hours it is now. Back then, it just ended when the kids decided to end it. I can remember one year, my sister Kayla and I stayed out to almost 11 p.m. Most of the houses would have already stopped answering their doors, but there was always a few houses still willing to pass out candy. I didn't even think to look at the time until I noticed that there was less and less kids each street that we came to. So when I looked at my phone, I said to Kayla, Jeez, it's 9.30, we should probably get back to the house. We can watch a movie and stuff ourselves with this. Proudly lifting up my pillowcase, I was at least more than halfway full. We slowly started walking back towards my house, and as we were passing each street, we noticed how eerily quiet it had gotten seemingly out of nowhere. People were turning off their porch lights, signaling that they were not going to be passing out any more candy. Now, I was a paranoid person back then, and I'm still a paranoid person to this day, probably even more so now. So when I got that feeling, that chill that runs up your back and your shoulders tense up, something is off, I thought to myself. I look side to side and get an urge to look behind me. I slowly turn my head around, looking over my shoulder, and what I saw nearly made me pee myself. About four houses down from us was Michael Myers, or someone dressed as Michael Myers, I should say, who was slowly walking behind us. But to me at the time, it might as well have been the real Michael Myers. He stopped, staring back at me, not moving any muscle, just staring. Now this would be creepy to anyone, but this, this was literally my worst nightmare. My number one childhood fear just so happened to be Michael Myers. A little backstory, when I was about four... My mom was busy cleaning the kitchen as I sat in the living room playing with my toys with the TV going in the background. The creepy music had caught my attention so I started glancing up at the movie while playing with my toys. I grew less and less interested in my toys and had my eyes glued to the TV already starting to grow nervous and scared by just the music alone. You know the part in the movie where Michael Myers pops out of the closet grabbing a hold of the victim and lifting him up in the air against the wall as his victim desperately tries to break free but is paralyzed with fear. And then Michael pulls back the knife and brutally stabs the guy to the wall, pinning him in the wall and in the air. Well, my four-year-old self had never seen something so gruesome and altogether just absolutely terrifying, and at that age I believed it was real. In my four-year-old mind, this was really happening to someone. My eyes bulged out of my head, instantly breaking out into tears, literally screaming my head off. His mask, the brutality, seeing someone being stabbed in this heinous murder. It blew my mind and all at once I felt so anxious, scared, sad, just panicking. My mom comes rushing over frantically trying to figure out what's wrong scooping me up in her arms and I was still screaming and pointed at the TV. By then, the movie continued to the bar where Michael Myers is dressed up with the sheet over his body, with the glasses on over the sheet that he stole off of the body of the victim, obviously pretending to be the guy he just murdered. The sheet freaked me out even more than Michael's mask. Watching the mask killer walk slowly, closer and closer up behind the girl on the phone, and I clung to my mom sobbing and burying my face into her shoulder. She looked over at the TV saying, Oh my god, how did this get on? It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, honey, you're okay. Trying to soothe me as she turned the channel off. I cried for at least an hour or more, just absolutely traumatized. After that incident, I couldn't sleep at all, especially alone in my bed and absolutely could not stand the dark. I knocked on my parents' bedroom door for months, begging them to let me sleep in their bed with them, or I swear, in my head I was convinced he was going to come down the dark hallway, silently creeping into my room and stab me in my sleep. I did not get over my fear of Michael Myers until I was in my early 20s, so being in 8th grade walking down a dark street, no one around besides just Kay and I, and seeing my absolute worst nightmare walking slowly behind us, I swear I thought I was going to pass out. I looked over at Kayla, my voice trembling and whispered, There's somebody following us. He's dressed as Michael Myers about four houses down. Take the pace, but do not start running. Kayla turned slowly over her shoulder and snapped her head back forward. What? That's so creepy. We got two blocks to go. We'll see if he follows us when we turn. I nod, a million thoughts going through my head. Maybe I'm overreacting. It is Halloween after all, but why is he alone? And to follow two young girls? When we get to my street, I glance behind me and I swear my heart stopped in that moment. 
he wasn't behind us anymore. I panicked, darting my eyes all around me. Oh my god, where did he go? He's gone. Kayla turns around, stopping in her tracks, squinting her eyes, trying to scan the area. Maybe he turned down the street. He probably wasn't even following us to begin with, she said as she spun back around, heading down the street again. And then I spotted him. He stepped out from behind a tree, but now he was only two houses away. He started walking towards us, gaining on us as I stood there, frozen in fear. I screamed, go. Kayla whipped around. Oh my god, we streaked as we started sprinting the rest of the way. But then I feel my legs start to wobble. God, no, this can't be real, it can't be. I thought to myself, somewhat in denial that this was actually happening. Could this really be happening? In that moment, I knew I had one goal, and that was to make it through my front door. We sprint up my driveway, both of us practically crashed into my front door, frantically turning the doorknob, and then my heart dropped. The door was locked. I'm pounding and pounding on the door, screaming for somebody to please hurry and open the door. I look behind me, and there he is, stepping onto the driveway, still heading straight for us. Where is everybody? Please, Mom, help us! I scream and glance back behind me. And he's gone. I went silent, listening intently for any noise when all of a sudden he slowly came around the side of the house just a few feet away. This means he walked from the left side of the house through my backyard and came around the right side of the house. I screamed while frantically falling through the door. My mom looked at us like we were insane and I yelled, Close the door! Kayla slammed it shut and looked out the window. Where is he? Where did he go? Kayla said, running to look out the front living room windows. Who are you talking about? My mom said, looking at me, completely confused. Someone was following us and it was someone dressed as Michael Myers. No, don't, I yelled as my mom opened the door and stepped outside, peering around the front yard. She stepped out to the driveway. I nervously watched out the screen door. She turned and yelled back to me. Well, there's no one now. It's... Must have just been someone messing with you. The thought did cross my mind. It is Halloween after all, but to think a grown man, I'm assuming, is walking around alone, messing with two young girls, stalking them for so long is just extremely unnerving. I have to say, since I'm older now and have seen the movies at least a million times, that stalker guy was 100% spot on with exactly how Michael is in the movies the walking slowly but gaining on us so fast at the same time, disappearing and popping up out of nowhere. Like I said, it may as well have been the real Michael Myers, but also the fact that this scenario was my number one childhood fear that I've had multiple nightmares about, and even though I'm much older now, reminiscing that night still gives me chills to this day. It's just, I can't help but wonder if it really was actually a prank gone too far, or if that person had more sinister intentions in store for us. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and get and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, Grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.